Hi. Uh, first, I'm uh, delighted to speak to teachers. Uh, I've been teaching only 47 years now. <laughs> this is my 47th, uh, 40 at UC Berkeley. And um, I want to start uh, a little bit with uh, what I do technically. Um, I work on uh, the relationship between the mind, the brain, and language. And uh, what we've been doing for the past um, uh, quarter of a century is trying to figure out exactly how the brain does thought and language, to model it with neural computation, uh, to look at neuroscience in doing that, to take the cognitive linguistics and the experimental psychology and bring them together. And they're actually coming together. I want to talk a little bit about that. But also, why you should care. As what, is it, what does it matter? Uh, the first thing to realize is you think with your brain. You don't have a choice. Ideas are not floating in air. Uh, the question is, how does that work? I mean, you got, uh, think of it this way. How do you get ideas out of neurons? Neurons just fire. But you know, how do you get ideas out of them? Well, we'll give you some ideas as we go along. But we have a pretty good sense of how that works. Secondly, why should you care? All right, think of it this way. Um, yesterday, uh, in the New York Times, there was a story that one out of four African American children coming into kindergarten assume they're going to fail. Right? What is that about? Well, first, uh, one thing we know is that you are born with 100 billion neurons, each connected to between 1,000 and 10,000 others. That gives you close to a quadrillion connections. And by the time you're five, half of them have died. The half not used. And that's important. By the time you're five, your brain has been, been shaped. And that's one of the reasons why early childhood education is absolutely crucial. One of the reasons why you must have it, why parents are, have to be involved in teaching. I mean, this is not uh, just something that you just can pick up at any time. What, is, what you've done earlier matters, and matters a lot. So just to begin there, you know, if anybody's going to talk about early childhood education, that should be sentence number one because most people don't know that. Very, very crucial. Second, uh, because you think with your brain, every idea that you have is physical. Ideas are not floating in air. They are physical. And we've been studying the structure of those ideas. We know a lot about them after doing it for, I've been doing it for 50 years uh, working on this. Now, what we've been doing is figuring out the, the details of these. We'll get into that in a bit. But crucially, every idea and every con uh, connection of ideas that you have uh, is given by a neural circuit in your brain. Okay? Now, many of those are fixed for life. They're there. They're things you learn, the ideas that you learn early, many of them early. And very often, they are metaphorical ideas, which we'll get to. But the important thing is that if you do not have a neural circuit for understanding uh, an idea, you won't understand it at all. It has to be close enough to what you're teaching. It has to be comprehensible. Otherwise, it'll go, quote, one in one ear and out the other. It won't ma make any sense. So when you're teaching, it's important to know what people already know. That's not trivial. It's extremely important to figure out because you know, if I try to teach something that it, with it, no one, there is nothing that anyone connect, can connect to, it's not going to be there. So that's the next sort of obvious thing to understand. Okay, what happens after that? Well, uh, the big thing to, to get is that the classical view of what reason is has failed. And that's important. Let me try to give you a sense of what I learned about reason. I learned that it was all conscious. It's 98% unconscious, and it has to be. Why? The brain functions in parallel. Reason functions linearly. Consciousness functions linearly. You have massive parallelism. You could not be uh, uh, consciously aware of most things going on in your brain. It's an impossibility. 
most things are going on and you don't know they're there, but they're structuring your conscious thought. So if you think you know what you're thinking, you probably don't. <laughs> and that's, but there are ways to find out, and that's important. So second, and what we've been doing is showing how you can find out. So that, that is crucial. Another idea that is taught about reason is this, that uh, reason is abstract and it's embodied, and not just embodied in the brain, but it comes out of your actual physical emb embodied experiences in ways that we'll talk about in a bit. That is, uh, it's not the case that you, yeah, reason is just abstract. Ideas don't float in the air. They come, meaning comes out of what you experience. Another idea that you get is that reason is logic. It's logical thinking. And there are logics of thinking, but uh, I was trained at MIT as a mathematician as well as uh, I also trained in literature, both, and linguistics. And what you find out when you do logic is that um, that's not how people mostly think. They mostly think in things called frames and metaphors. What is a frame? Very simple. Uh, think of the frame of a classroom. Okay? You have typically you know, a teacher, students, a subject matter, uh, et cetera, maybe lessons, pl lesson plans, uh, ideas of what you're teaching, but, and lots of other big ideas that you guys are trying to change. But there are other things that don't happen in a classroom. You don't have surgery in most of, you know, K to 12 classrooms. Uh, you know, you don't have, uh, hopefully, herds of elephants coming through your classroom. Uh, I mean, things don't happen there, other things do. All right? In this, there are things called semantic roles. You're a teacher, that's a role that you play. Students play a role, they come in. They may be of any age, and they're still students. You may be of any age, you're still a teacher. Okay? That is, you play that role. That is what a frame is. It has roles, it has things that happen in whatever you're talking about or thinking about. Metaphors are not in language, they're in thought. The language is superficial. The language is real, there are linguistic metaphors, but Metaphorical thought is much, much deeper. So let me give you a feel for that. Um, the first, or here's, here's one. Um, you've heard of the fiscal cliff, right? You probably have heard of it a lot, right? Now, uh, other people have pointed out, ec economists have pointed out that there is no such thing, that, you know, it's not there. Uh, and uh, what happens is they've tried to change the metaphor and it doesn't work. Make it a fiscal hill, doesn't work. A fiscal curb, doesn't work. The austerity bomb, doesn't work, etc. Why? What happens is this. The fiscal cliff is what we'll call a super metaphor. It is something that has a, what is called a cascade of other deeper metaphors supporting it. That cascade is fixed in your brain, and it's hard to get rid of it. And let me try to give you a feel for how powerful that can be. Uh, you have a metaphor that is around the world, but many metaphors are, are learned everywhere uh, simply through experience, like more is up, less is down. Why is more up? You pour every water in the glass, the level goes up. There's a correlation in your experience, and that correlation in your experience is registered in your brain in two different parts, and you learn a circuit connecting them. That circuit in your brain is more is up. Now, uh, in that, you understand the stock market is going up, the GDP is going up or down, et cetera. If you look at the graphs that you have of, uh, let's say, of the GDP or a stock market graph, it's going to go forward and up or down, right? Perfectly normal. Why should you have an economy seen as moving? Ever thought of that? An economy is a collection of economic activity. There is a general metaphor that action is motion. You say, how is your project coming along? How are things going? Well, I'm stuck, you know, hit a brick wall, all of those things, right? right? Action is motion. And the economy is seen, therefore, as moving. Why is it moving forward? Because the future is ahead and the, and the past is behind. 
right? There's a reason for that. We're looking ahead to things. That's why it's moving forward. And then you have a measure of economic activity to go up or down. Fine. Now, what is the fiscal cliff about? When Bernanke introduced this, what did he say? He said, oh, he had in mind the idea that oil well, economy might go up a little for a while, but if you, certain things happen, it could go way down. And you have a picture of this cliff. So far, so good. But what do you know about a cliff? It's not just something that goes down. It's dangerous, right? You know, you could drive off a cliff and die. Falling is failing, right? If you die, that's the end of it. And if the economy dies, it's non-functional, right? Like the computer dying, it's non-functional. Metaphorically, the fiscal, and therefore you're going to be afraid of it. The fiscal cliff has all of those things at once. All of those frames and metaphors are there simultaneously in the fiscal cliff, but not in the fiscal hill or the fiscal curb or any random metaphor. You can't just replace a metaphor and have it fit reality. The fiscal cliff does not fit reality at all, but it's there and it's going to stay there because it's so deep. Right? <coughs> so one of the things you need to know is what are the other deep uh, metaphors that are there. They're important if you're teaching, and they're all over the place. By the way, is there some water? Because I could use some. <coughs> Sorry. Um, now, uh, rescue. Thanks. Terrific. It even has lemon in it. Cool. Now, um, there's another very deep thing that we learned, uh, I learned about when I went to school about rationality. Rationality is supposed to be about self-interest and maximizing that self-interest. And one of the things that has been learned in neuroscience uh, is the following. In 1996, a remarkable thing happened in Parma, Italy. Uh, in the neuroscience lab of Professor Rizzolatti, and I've been in the lab, they were studying, uh, and I've worked with people there, uh, I've, they were studying macaque monkeys. And they were trying to figure out exactly what neurons were firing when the monkey did certain tasks. And they had implantations in the monkey's brain for neuron by neuron uh, checks, and, uh, which is quite remarkable in itself, in the premotor cortex, which choreographs actions. So actions happen up here, premotor over here, connections underneath. Right? Now, um, the, if you're going to uh, pick up something, like this glass, and take a drink, I have to do lots of things. I have to raise my shoulder, I have to hold it, I have to move my elbow. Each one of those is one thing that is done up here in the motor cortex. Those actions are choreographed elsewhere in the premotor cortex. And what they discovered was this. Uh, they had trained the monkey to, let's say, eat bananas, peel a banana and eat it, eat peanuts, fine, press a button, uh, grab a ring, uh, grasp objects, let them go, things like that. And they could find out what was firing in the brain. One day, uh, one of the people running the experiment, who I've since gotten to be friends with, uh, went out, uh, had lunch, the uh, experiment was going fine, came back, saw a pile of bananas, started peeling it and eating it, and heard the machine go click, 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 as if because the monkey's brain was firing. So he went to see what was firing, and what was firing was the set of neurons for peeling and eating a banana. But the monkey wasn't eating the banana, he was. Right? He discovered mirror neurons. That is, there are a set of neural circuits in the brain that fire when you perform an action or you see someone else perform the same one. Now, in addition, those neurons are connected to the emotional regions of the brain, which is why you can tell if somebody else is writhing in pain or if they're happy or smiling or feeling sad or drooping. You can see it because you see their muscles and they're connected to yours. And every emotion you have has a physical correlate. So, and that's remarkable. So one, we have a physical basis for empathy. 
Think about that. Second, there's a ridge near there, about this far away in the brain. And in that ridge, there's another set of neurons that fire when you either uh, see an object or there's a normal action you would perform on that object. You see a banana, you peel and eat it, but it does, that's a, a normal, what's called a canonical action. But sticking it in your ear is not a canonical action. So the neurons fire for the canonical actions, but not for sticking it in your ear. Okay? So they, what that means is you are connected to the physical world by normal actions. We evolved to figure out well, how to act normally in the physical world. We are physically connected to that. Now think about what that means about the environment. The word environment suggests it's outside of us. It's actually also inside of us. You cannot enact in the environment without it being inside of you. And that changes the whole idea of what environmentalism is. Right? We can get into that later. It's a very important change. So one thing is this about emotions. Very important thing about emotions. There are certain parts of the brain that fire when you are feeling certain emotions. Those are connected physically to your body. So, for example, when you experience anger, your skin temperature goes up about half a degree. Your heartbeat rate goes up. Your blood pressure goes up. It's harder for you to see accurately. It's harder for you to do fine movements accurately. Right? Standard things. It turns out that that physiology of anger gives you the metaphors for understanding anger. That's why you can say, my blood is boiling. He's red in the face, etc. He's about to blow up. Okay? Uh, and, uh, and on and on. Uh, we've studied this in very great detail. Uh, and uh, I have, we have, um, there are now long studies and books on this for the full range of emotions. They all work metaphorically by the physiology of the emotion. What you learn about the brain and how it's connected to the body shows you how you're thinking and therefore also how you're speaking and what the, those ideas are. They're not separate. Now, one of the most important discoveries about the brain is this. When you are imagining something, the same part of the brain is used as when you're actually experiencing it. So when you're imagining seeing something, the same part of the brain is used as when you're actually seeing. When you are imagining moving some part of your body, the same part of the brain is used as when you're actually doing it. So there are uh, fMRI studies. They'll put people in the machine and say, OK, you're, imagine you're you know, kicking. Kick, first, I move your leg to kick a soccer ball. They move their leg, a certain part of the brain up here fires. Now, uh, move your um, hand to um, grasp uh, a baseball. Okay, they move their hand, it fires there. Now, imagine, move your, move your, you know, move your mouth to bite an apple. Fire's there. Fine. Now, uh, imagine, don't move anything. Imagine kicking. Same part of the brain fires. Imagine grasping. Same part fires. Imagine biting. The same part fires. The same part of the brain is firing when you're imagining as when you're doing. And it also is true when you are remembering, when you are dreaming, and when you're understanding language. Language is, me under the meaning of language involves mental simulation in your brain, right? You are simulating what you're understanding in your brain. And when you're doing that, you're also engaging your mirror neuron systems to understand and connect with other people. And your canonical neuron, uh, uh, your canonical neuron systems to connect with the world. That is, you are connecting with people when you are reading. So now think about reading novels. What is involved in that? Or reading poetry, or understanding art, or involving or seeing a play. What you're doing, if you understand it, is simulating what is going on. You're becoming part of those pre people. You're understanding that, and you're imagining things that don't exist in the world, but that you could experience through them. Right? What you're doing is learning how to simulate things. 
Now, you can simulate things all the time through, you know, which don't exist. You can make up things that don't exist, and the question is, how are you doing it? What is the brain mechanism? Let me give you an example. Um, uh, imagine a flying pig whose name is Pigasus. Okay? Uh, what does that flying pig look like? How does it fly? What? It has wings. Where are the wings? On its back. Uh, which way is its snout directed relative to the wings in terms of its direction of motion? It's going horizontal and forward, where the beak of a bird would be, right? How did you all know that? You saw the movie. You saw the movie. <laughs> ah, but there's another kind of flying pig whose name is Super Swine, <laughs> who's got a cape. It goes like this. Okay. Now, the point is you can do this instantly in about half a second. How? Okay. The name for, the, for this phenomenon is neural binding. And what it does is this. If there are uh, circuits for taking ideas that you already have, pigs and birds, and binding the relevant parts together, the wings of the birds, the shape of the pig, and so on. And you can't move things in your brain. All you can do is have connections between them. And the question is, how do you get those connections? And that's what we're figuring out. And it's a fairly straightforward way, uh, given what we know about neural learning. I'm not going to give you a lecture on neural learning. But it's crucial. Your brain can do this like that. You can imagine new things. And the question is, how do you get trained to imagine new things? It's a natural thing that your brain can do. And that is by reading, by reading poetry, learning to understand it, through drama, through the arts, through um, folk tales, through all of those things. Now, uh, let me talk a little bit about mathematics, because one of the things that you are constantly taught is the following. We need to teach more math and science in the schools. And we do. Let's not debate that. Uh, and we also need to have more innovation in our economy. We have to out-innovate everybody else, right? We have to have new ideas, which is why we have a big ideas conference. Right? That's why you're here. The big ideas come from neural simulation, which comes from reading and thinking and putting things together and all of those things. It doesn't just come from learning the math and science. Though there are big ideas in math and science, but they're not, they're not training the imagination in just that way. And that's important. It is important, if you're going to think about innovating anything and train people to do that, to have them read and learn about the arts. And by the arts, I include the visual arts. Um, I spent some time back in the late 70s uh, on the, um, back in the Carter administration, for those of you who might remember that. <laughs> Uh, on the um, policy panel of the uh, NEA Vi Visual Arts Division, uh, you know, working on arts policy. And what they needed to do was change arts policy. I was the consulting linguist. They needed a non-artist. And what we did was something important. Uh, we, we changed the definition of art with respect to grants. Up until that time, Photography and crafts were not considered art and could not get grants. And we said, photography is art. You know, if you're, you know, all sorts of craft making is art all over the country, right? We changed it because you can innovate in, even in the government. <laughs> even in the, in the field of art, you can, you, you're going to innovate even in administration, you can innovate. You can change things because you can think a new thought. Okay. Now, one of the things that I've been uh, doing for the last 35 years is studying metaphorical thought. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about how that happened. Uh, all right. they, uh, in 1978, I was uh, teaching a freshman undergraduate seminar at Berkeley with six people sitting around a table. And uh, 
one of the one and one day we were reading various papers and we, we were reading a paper on metaphor on the classical view of metaphor and the philosophical view of metaphor and so on and um, it was raining because it was February sort of like it's today and uh, one of the young women in the class came in a little bit late and drenched and in tears. So uh, she sat down at the table about four feet away from everybody else and we all tried not to notice that she was in tears. Okay, so we're discussing this and on page 10, professor so-and-so says this, what do you think about that? Let's go around the table. We get to her, she says, I'm sorry, I can't do this today. I've got a metaphor problem with my boyfriend. <laughs> Maybe you guys can help. 1978 in Berkeley, we say, sure. <laughs> All well trained. <laughs> she says, on the way over here, my boyfriend said something disturbing. He said that our relationship had hit a dead end street. You know, I don't understand what to make of this. And we said, OK, well, look, if it's hit a dead end street, you can't keep going the way it's been going. You may have to turn back, right? we realized that there were several expressions in which love was talked about in terms of travel. So this is a linguistics class, right? So we say, OK, let's look at all the ways in which love can be talked about in terms of travel. OK, guys, how can you understand love relationships in terms of travel? Well, one at a time. <laughs> what was it? I didn't hear that. Getting to first base, what else? <laughs> Off ramp. Hmm? Off ramp. <laughs> Others? It's a bumpy road. It's a long, <laughs> bumpy road. What else? Fly me to the moon. Fly me to the moon, right. More? It's a journey. What else? What kind of journey? Right? A long journey. Relationship can be on the rocks, off the track. What else? Spinning your wheels. In the what? In the, air. In the air, yes. Train what? Train, train wreck. <laughs> right. You, if it's in the air, you may have to bail out. Right? Went separate ways. Went separate ways. You're going in different directions. You're at a crossroads. Go all the way. Right? Hmm? Go all the way. Go all the way, yes. <laughs> now, given those, we said, OK, nice list. Right? Uh, is there a generalization about this list? That's what we do. That's our job, to figure out the general principles. So you say, yeah, uh, what are the lovers in these metaphors? Travelers. They're travelers, right? What is the relationship? It's a vehicle, either a car, a train, a boat, a plane, whatever. Right? What's going on is they are traveling together in a vehicle toward common goals. OK? And these, each metaphor is about the problems in doing that. So it's always you know, on the rocks, off the track, going in different directions, you know, et cetera, bailing out. It's about those difficulties in relationships in terms of travel. Fine. And the young lady says, I'm sorry. I don't care about your generalization. <laughs> My boyfriend is breaking up with me. He's thinking in terms of this metaphor. Well, OK, I'm the linguistics professor. I say, that's interesting. How can you think in terms of a metaphor? How does that work? Okay. Let's take spinning your wheels in the relationship. Okay. Uh, you have that. Is there an image that you have? No. Right. Where are the wheels? Are the wheels, is it just wheels, or are they attached to something? They're in, in mud and sand, and are they, is there something that they're attached to? Or just the wheels? The car, okay, it's the car. Is the car moving? No. no. Do you want it to be moving? Yes. Are you trying to get it moving? Yes. How do you feel? Perfect. You all know the right answers. <laughs> now, that, given that image and the knowledge about the image, let's apply the metaphor, which is basically a mapping from Travel to love via lovers or travelers, etc. Okay, so the traveler, the lovers are travelers in that vehicle. The, the love relationship is not getting anywhere. It's not going toward their common life goals. 
They're trying to get it to move, to go somewhere, and they're frustrated. And that's what that idiom means, right? Now, it turns out that they all work like this. There's a general metaphor that, that maps travel to love and that this works for all sorts of cases, whether you're going in different directions. They mean different things because each of those is a separate image with separate knowledge, but the general metaphor applies to it. That's cool. Okay? It's like what we saw with the fiscal cliff. It's a deep thing. Now, uh, what we learn from that is that metaphorical thought is normal. Now, how is that possible? How do you learn metaphorical thought at all? The answer is you use your brain, and you don't know you're using it, and you're usually a little kid. So how do little kids learn metaphorical thought, and when do they learn it by? About two years and nine months, maybe three. I have a three-year-old granddaughter. She's doing just fine. <laughs> all right, how does that work? Here you're a little kid, and you look around, and you see your parents pouring water into a glass or milk into a bottle every time the level goes up. Now, you may not be paying attention consciously, but your brain is. It notices verticality change, quantity change, and that there's a relationship between them. More is up. And two parts of the brain together notice this. Or suppose they're held warmly, that is, they're, they're held affectionately, and they experience temperature in different parts of the brain. What happens is these parts of the brain start being active. And as they become active over and over again, the activation spreads along existing pathways. And it spreads further and further till the shortest pathway is found between them. And you form a circuit. And that circuit is the metaphor of warm as war is up or for affection as warmth. Now, once you have those in your brain, they affect behavior. They're not just there for understanding, which they are there for. They're not just there for language. They affect what you do. You live according to them. You know? So for example, uh, we understand time as a resource, a money-like resource. You spend time, invest your time, budget your time, et cetera. And you live that way, we have a clock right here, right? Telling me the time, how much time we have for this talk, right? We live by that metaphor. And we live by lots and lots of them all over the place. Now, the experiments are cool or warm, depending on how you think about it. So here's an example. At Yale, which is a pretty cold place in the winter, uh, John Barge uh, and his students set up an experiment where they brought in subjects, and they gave half of them a warm cup of coffee, nice in the winter, and the other half a cold cup of coffee. And then they brought them in and said, now we're going to start the experiment. Tell us, imagine you've met somebody. What are they like? The guys who got the warm cups of coffee met friendly people, <laughs> and the other guys met unfriendly people. <laughs> All right, similar experiment in Toronto, which is also cold in winter. Okay. They bring in some uh, subjects, usually college sophomores. And uh, you know they go into a room. And the people in the room are told in advance we're gonna, who the subjects are. And they say, OK, some of them we're going to snub. We're going to treat them, you know, act like they're lepers. Other people are going to be very warm about, we'll greet them, we'll be friendly, et cetera, you know, in a systematic way. Right? Now, afterwards, uh, these people leave, and on the way out, they're asked to judge the temperature of the room. The ones who are treated warmly say it's five degrees warmer than the ones who are snubbed. Okay? Now, I can go on and on. There's a marvelous book that just came out about a month ago called Louder Than Words by Benjamin Bergen. And it's, it is an introduction to how the brain works and how the mind works through 200 such experiments. Beautifully done and funny, because <laughs> he's hilarious. Now, so you know, if you're interested in this at all, Louder Than Words is a great book. It's also very readable, easy to understand, uh, and so on. I recommend it very highly. But the point here is that how you behave has to do with the metaphorical cascades that you learn. 
and that stay there with you all your life. They're there. And that's important to know. Now, what else is important to know? We know from empathy and from the mirror neurons, which are the basis of empathy, that there are a couple of ways that you can teach. You can be a nurturant teacher, empathizing with your students, or you can be a strict teacher, trying to discipline them, periodly, getting them to do what you want, period. And those are very different ways of teaching. And they have very different effects on students. When you're teaching to the test, you're trying to just give them information. And there's another metaphor used. And that metaphor is what is called the conduit metaphor. It's one of the major metaphors for communication. It says that ideas are th objects, words are containers, and communication is putting the ideas into words and sending them to somebody else, who then takes the same ideas out of the words. You've heard this theory. It doesn't work. It is absolutely false. That's not how you communicate. Other people have to have the same brain, the same kinds of metaphors, the same kinds of frames. They have to have a basis in the neural structure to understand what you're saying. Right? Teaching is a two-way street, always. It's not the conveying of information. It is not the conveying of information. That is, learning involves something active. You've got to do something. Right? Now, one of the problems with the way that computer teaching is done is it's all too often done by the con assuming a conveying of information. I'm going to sit there on the screen and be passive, uh, you know, uh, not move, and I'm going to convey you information that somebody else is going to get. Wrong. They're going to have to interact in some way. They're going to have to be doing something, and preferably not in front of a computer. Preferably with a real human being, because if you're really learning something, it's largely because you care about it. And you care about it when someone empathizes with you. Right? This is very important. Now, you may wonder why it is that certain kinds of people with political ideas want to, are, are very much coming down on teachers these days. Why do they want to get rid of teachers? Why, what, you know, teachers are wonderful. Why? Because if you look at their ideology and the way they think about the world, it's in terms of strictness, not in terms of nurturance. It's in terms of strictness in the economy, in business, in you know, every aspect of life. And it's very different than if you're thinking in terms of nurturance and caring. One of the reasons that they want to privatize education is to control the content of it, but also how it is taught and who teaches it. And they want to get rid of nurturers, you. That's serious. It's very, very serious. There's a reason for this, and it's not just budgets. Right? And there are metaphors involved here and frames that are important. Uh, what is a pension? A pension is delayed pay for work already done. When they cut pensions, they're stealing your money. Think about it. Nobody's saying that. People are not out there. Political leaders are not saying that. They need to say things like that. Because that kind of frame is toxic. The idea that you're just, after you retire, well, we're paying you for doing nothing. Hardly. We're paying you for a lifetime of work with delayed pay. Right? Crucial to understand that. If you just, you know, if you look at the discourse, there are metaphors being used that are harmful. Harmful not just to you, but to your students and to our country. Right? So it's really important that you understand how brains work. This is not trivial. And this comes out in every aspect from the fiscal cliff on down. So I want to stop now and just take your questions and whatever you want to talk about. It's, the floor is yours. Uh, 